Welcome to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast, your guide to future tech trends and innovation in a language you understand. Now, over to your host, Neil Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. I was chatting with a friend the other day, and he, and he told me that in his office, there was a conversation, a very serious conversation, about banning the use of mobile phones. Now, in a mobile first world where we drift from device to device to get our work done and collaborate and increase our productivity, this seemed like an incredibly backward move. Yes, I completely understand that if you work in a shop or a factory, you don't need your phone and and that business will ask that you leave your phone in a locker. That's a different environment. I get that. But my friend was talking about a busy tech company where mobile communication was essential. And it's got me thinking, I mean, we've got people listening all over the world. And has anyone listening encountered that kind of analog thinking? And what were the reasons? How did they justify it? You don't have to reveal the company name, but I'd love to hear more about your experiences and how some companies are still trying to restrict the use of technology or mobile technology in the workplace rather than open it up. As always, you can email me techblogwriter at outlook.com. You can find all the links to my social channels at the bottom of my website, techblogwriter.co.uk. I'm kind of interested in what kind of stories you come back with there, so please send them in. But on today's show, I'm going to be speaking with Hazelcast CEO Kelly Herrell, who has an inspiring background because he put himself through graduate school by working on a commercial fishing boat for 18 hours a day, seven days a week for 110 straight days in the unforgiving North Pacific every year. But at the end of all that, he's now spearheading Hazelcast, which is an in-memory computing company providing services to the likes of JP Morgan Chase, Charter Communications, LMA, UBS, National Australia Bank, Sigma Stream, and so many more. I absolutely love stories like this. So buckle up and hold on tight so I can beam your ears all the way to California so we can speak with Kelly Herrell, who's going to tell us all about his story and Hazelcast. So a massive warm welcome to the show, Kelly. Can you tell the listeners a little more about who you are and what you do? Certainly. Uh, Kelly Harrell, I'm the CEO of Hazelcast. We are a venture-funded growth stage software and cloud company, and we power some of the most difficult but immensely valuable applications for the world's largest organizations. Uh, We're a multinational company. We're headquartered in Palo Alto, California, right in the heart of Silicon Valley. Fantastic. Now, on this Daily Tech podcast, we talk about how technology is transforming the world of business and our lives. But I'm also fascinated by the very human stories behind tech leaders and their success. So can I ask you to share your journey, which I believe began by putting yourself through graduate school by working on a commercial fishing boat for 18 hours a day, seven days a week for 110 straight days in the unforgiving North Pacific each year. Is that right? (laughs) <laughs> yes, uh, I think I have to take the Wayback Machine for those memories. But uh, yeah, it's true. My my father was a military officer. Uh, no one in my family had any money, and he pushed me to become financially independent at a very early age. Uh, we lived in a fishing village, and I signed on to my first boat actually when I was 11 years old. Um, the fishing season is only open for a finite period of time, so <clears throat> when it's open, you work every day, all day. So a typical schedule would have you up by three in the morning and you'd be home at 10 o'clock at night. Um, Sometimes you'd be 120 miles offshore and stay out for a few days. And under those conditions, my duties only allowed for about two hours of sleep a night. So that's tough when it's nonstop. I (laughs) was probably violating any number of child labor laws, but uh, I made good money. And the family rule was that you save half of everything you make. And uh, meanwhile, my father made me increasingly pay for my own expenses, you know, clothes, entertainment, and on and on. So he told me early that if I was going to be going to college, I was going to have to pay for it myself. And by that point, I had also learned to love financial freedom. So even though it was a rough life, every year I returned to the boats. And uh, you know, as you say, the North Pacific is no joke. It can, it can get really nasty. So you'd run into some pretty scary stuff. Um, you know, I, I remember the first time I thought I was going to die. I was 13. You know, it was the middle of the night. 100, 100 miles or more offshore in a really bad storm. It was pitch black, and you know, every few seconds we get hit by a wave that we were sure we're gonna, it was going to roll us over. And out there, if you go in, 
you know, the water's so cold, you only have about 15 minutes before hypothermia kicks in. So and it would take two hours for a helicopter to get out there if they could find you. So, uh, you know, that's kind of the way it was. But, you know, we lived to fish another day, and that's that's the way it is in that life. Um, by the time I was 18, I earned my U.S. Coast Guard captain's license. Uh, I think that made me the youngest captain on the West Coast. But, uh, you know, because of the family rule for saving money, by then I had enough to go to college. And during the summer, I captained a boat in Alaska to pay for the next year's tuition. So by the time I'd finished my undergraduate degree, I'd fished for 11 years. And as I headed to graduate school, then I hung up my boots. And that was <laughs> probably one of the happiest days of my life. <laughs> You say that, though, and I know it probably didn't feel like it at the time, but looking back, do you think that was the best thing that your father could have actually done? And it's actually paved the way for your success now with, by installing that work ethic in you? Well, there's no question that it impacted me in a, in a, in a way that probably is beneficial um, for the line of work that I chose. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, you know, aside from the ethic, uh, you know, there's a, a certain resilience um, that comes with that. You know, there's an old phrase that, uh, you know, uh, the most uh, exciting thing that can happen to you is uh, to be shot at and missed. So, you know, when you build young companies, um, which, you know, I've chosen as a, as a career path, uh, um, the Hazelcast is my fifth. Um, you know, you, you need to have that resilience. And I, I think that uh, to some degree um, that the way I was brought up probably, you know, imbued that in me. I'm curious. I've got to ask. I mean, do you have any children yourself? Uh, I do. I do. And, I have a 16-year-old and, and, and boy. And, and has that rubbed off on you? Do you try and pass a similar kind of lesson on to him now? Well, I think, you know, everybody responds to something different. Um, yeah. He's a he's a very self-motivated uh, young man. I'm very, very fortunate in that regard. He's smart. He's energetic. He's got all the things going for him. So he just needs a little bit of guidance. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I could have drawn a completely different card, but that's the one that I've got. And I'm, I'm, I feel fortunate about that. Fantastic. Now, you went on to drive high value innovation into the infrastructure <clears throat> of the world's largest customers, including six of the world's largest banks, five of the world's largest e-commerce companies and four of the largest telecom companies. It's an incredible journey. It really is. But can, can I ask the most valuable lessons that you've learned along the way? Uh, yes, definitely. I mean, the, the first thing on, you know, very aggressive technology, uh, the first thing is the actual creation of value itself. You know, we, we solve extremely hard problems. Uh, in some cases, customers use Hazelcast to create solutions that were previously unthinkable because the capability wasn't there. And to be able to build a software platform that can perform that kind of capability and provide that opportunity, you know, you first you you have to hire very very talented technologists who are very self motivated by Everest level challenges. You know, not people who require prodding. So you really need to attract the absolute best and the brightest. Uh, I think second is, you know, the criticality of teamwork and resilience. Um, from that, you know, and, and we're a multi multicultural and geographically distributed organization. So, you know, as a leader, I found that one of the most important things I can do to facilitate that teamwork and resilience is to articulate a powerful, meaningful vision for the future, uh, one that shows how we're changing the world for the better. Um, it has to be a vision that everyone on the team can understand, something they'll they'll sign up for. And be able to hold in their mind every day as a motivator because, you know, not every day is an easy day and we need that purpose to drive us. But, uh, you know, aside from you know, creating value and, and, and really, um, you know, aligning the team, ultimately it's all about the customer. And, and here, especially at Hazelcast, you have to earn your stripes every day. You know, when we win a deal, we don't celebrate. Those, you know, these are the world's most demanding customers, and they're playing for keeps. Uh, they've got a lot of business at stake. So, you know, my, my joke is when we get a purchase order, if we turn it over, it says, admit one to the next fight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if our software sneezes, our customers get a cold. <laughs> um, they, you know, uh, they demand that our system never goes down. Um, because they know that every second can be worth millions of dollars to them. So it's an extreme requirement. So we need to maintain extreme vigilance and be as proactive as we can with them. So that's, you know, that's what we have to do. I've learned a lot in the process, but you know, if, if and when we perform, which we do um, very, very well, and we maintain our priorities, they continue to reward us. 
And here in 2019, you are the CEO at Hazelcast, which is an in-memory computing company providing services to Sigma, Sigma Stream and so many big technology clients in the financial service industry, uh, amongst, amongst many others. But for people hearing about Hazelcast for the very first time, could you maybe tell them a little bit more about how you're actually helping businesses, the kind of problems that you're solving and what makes you unique? Yeah, well, as the world has gone digital, it's it's placed new demands on computing infrastructure. Um, in, in the previous era, pre-digital era, it was okay if a system had a little bit of a delay in it. Uh, everything was kind of slow, so the entire picture was in balance, and you know, we were just clicking along at a certain speed. But not anymore. I mean, digital means fast. It means really fast, as in millions of a second fast. And Hazelcast performs computing at that speed. And we do it as a software layer inside of existing servers. Um, we, we, what we do is we bring the necessary data into memory, and then we do all of the computing in memory at megahertz speeds instead of the relatively slow RPM speeds that disk drives uh, uh, work out. So it's called in-memory computing, and it's exploding in popularity, especially among uh, customers who understand that time is money. And that's why we have such a large customer base in financial services, uh, for example, and you know, even more specifically, you know, one example would be credit card processing. I mean, the logos on those plastic cards that are in your wallet, those are Hazelcast customers. Um, so are the world's largest e-commerce companies. And just to help people understand the scale of the problems that we're dealing with here, I read a great quote from you where you were talking about the boom in memory computing. And you said it's spurred by the need for extreme speed among global 2000 businesses as mere microseconds of delay can actually mean billions in payment fraud undetected, missed e-commerce transactions or even failing to predict an industrial disaster. I mean, can you expand on that just to help people visualize just how serious it is? Certainly. Uh, let's just take card processing as an example. Um, if you look at, uh, you know, those plastic cards in your wallet, um, you know, everything's gone digital. And uh, and that's changed the number of transactions. It's exploded the number of transactions at an exponential rate. Um, and the reason it's done that is because the number of card terminals has exploded. I mean, if, if, then if that, you're scratching your head about that, just remember that you know, the, a credit card terminal used to be this physical thing that was in a brick and mortar building, but that's all changed. Your mobile phone now has become a card terminal. Amazon is a giant terminal. So what that's done is it has it created an Everest scale challenge for the card processing companies because it's just blown up the number of transactions they have to process. Um, matter of fact, one of the world's largest told me recently that on Black Friday, which is the big ship, uh, shopping day here in the U.S., um, that they hit a peak of over 100 million transactions in a single day. Okay. So, you know, in this digital world, these card processors, they have to do two things. First, they have to handle that transaction load without ever slowing down. They can't miss any transactions. And second, because this is digital now and fraud has become very commonplace, every transaction has to be padded down for fraud before it's approved. So it's kind of a double challenge from a computing standpoint, but it's something that Hazelcast addresses. So, you know, when you look at that load of transactions and realize that those are financial transactions, imagine if the system was slow to respond and couldn't handle the load. Or imagine if the system even went down for one second on that day. You know, that's a lot of money lost. It's potentially a lot of fraud allowed. So, you know, those are the kind of speed and scale challenges that Hazelcast addresses. And we can do it for anything from transactions to facial recognition. And, you know, we can even use machine learning or artificial intelligence on it. And a few weeks ago, I think it's worth highlighting that Hazelcast, uh, I think it raised 21.5 million funding and ex expanding the platform to real-time real, real -time streaming data too. So what excites you most about the, that, ex uh, that announcement and what would it mean for your customers? Well, our market timing is right on and yeah. we needed the money to be able to scale the customer, or uh, some sorry, scale the, the company faster. You know, the funding really enables us to stand up first the Hazelcast managed service, which we're, we're it's going to it will run in Google, Amazon, and Azure. So that's an a, uh, an evolution of the company. Um, and very importantly, uh, the funding gives us the ability to bring a new capability to market called low latency stream processing. And what this means is that we can process data while it's still moving across the network before it's ever stored somewhere, and we can do that incredibly fast. So. When time is money, you know, we provide even more value with stream processing. 
And this also enables all sorts of new powerful applications, including, as I said, things powered by machine learning and AI, like facial recognition. So uh, stream processing is going to transform the world, and we intend to be a major player in that. It really feels like it's been an incredibly busy year for you guys. I mean, only seven months in. Uh, it seems that you've repeatedly strengthened your cloud native offerings and introduced new managed services. But looking further into the future, what's your big goal? I mean, is there anything else you can reveal about that vision? You know, the thing I enjoy the most about companies I've helped build is, is identifying a hot technology trend before most others have and driving the company to a position of category domination. Um in-memory computing is here to stay. It's pretty clear that that's the case. Even the industry analysts are now starting to talk about that. And you know, we have the chance to build a powerful franchise in this market and really build some strong strategic alliances. So you know, that's the goal, pure and simple, to, to change the world. And when speaking with your customers, what are, the, what are their biggest concerns regarding databases today and around security and complexity? Are there any particular trends around that? Yeah, I think the one thing is, is that you know databases are not going away. They're very, very important. They're critical, and th that's where we store our data. Um, it, we need databases, but they're not designed for you know this lightning fast type of transaction processing, lightning fast type of computing. They're they're designed to store data and do some transactions on it, but not at the digital speed. So. The biggest concern that, that, that I run into with customers is they're trying to figure out you know, how they can handle the new load that the digital world's throwing at them and realizing that they, their, their databases just can't stretch to reach that. So the, the, it's, it's a very interesting discussion when you begin to talk to very uh, uh, you know, powerful you know, uh, CIOs in the industry and, and introduce to them the fact that actually they can use memory as a new computing medium, medium and uh, and, and be able to address those loads without having to replace their databases. Uh, Hazelcast actually sits above the database. It, it, it is a complement to the database, not a uh, not a replacement. And uh, that is you know a big sense of relief for um, for our customers who are working to stand up these new digital applications and realizing that they can do so actually without having to replace their databases because that that actually is is one of the biggest concerns that they're running into. Um, once they realize that replacing a database is not a requirement, it's uh, it, it starts to get a real the conversation gets real interesting after that. And when you're having so many conversations with clients and so many different businesses, are there any common myths or misconceptions in the industry that you'd like to finally lay to rest or or just set the record straight? Well, that's a good question. You know, I I, I think the um, the, the concept of in-memory computing has been kind of niche in the past. Uh, people didn't realize how mainstream it was starting to go. Um, and you know, Hazelcast has been immensely successful with really large customers, but we haven't been able to talk about it publicly because the advantages that the customers were getting from uh, the solutions that, that we were powering were of strategic value and they, they basically didn't want to give the information to their competitors. So, um, you know, there's this perception of perhaps that that in memory computing is is a niche, uh, you know, not a mainstream kind of a, a technology. But but I would put that to bed right now, because, you know, if, if you could see the logo list of customers that we have, uh, you would realize that, you know, this is um, mainstream, major production uh, computing and it's here to stay. And for any business leaders or anybody who just wants to find out more information and pop over to your website and see some of the kind of businesses that you're working with, can you just point them in the direction of your website and also how they can reach a member of your team if they're left with any questions? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, all of our contact info is at uh, hazelcast.com. And uh, we're also alive and well on the major digital venues like Twitter and LinkedIn. Excellent. Well, I'll add all those links to the blog posts that will accompany this podcast. And I'm not just saying this, but I've interviewed nearly a thousand people on this Daily Tech podcast now. But your inspirational story is one that's going to stay with me for a long, long time. And so I cannot thank you enough for sharing that personal story and also the great success you're having at Hazelcast and how in-memory computing is entering the mainstream. So thanks so much for joining me today, Kelly. I appreciate it. Hey, I appreciate the opportunity, Neil. Thanks so much. I love the point that Kelly highlighted there, that we have this huge boom in in-memory computing and how it's spurred by the need for extreme speed among global 2000 businesses. But the point that mere microseconds of delay 
could now mean billions in payment fraud, could now mean billions in payment fraud that goes undetected, missed e-commerce transactions, or even failing to predict an industrial disaster. I really enjoyed this one and the story behind it too. Really inspirational. So I hope you enjoyed this podcast. So I hope you enjoyed today's interview as much as I did. And did it raise any other questions from you? Or or do you have any insights that you can share with me on this subject? Or just have a, a question to ask me. My door is always open to each and every one of you. So you can email me techblogwriter at outlook.com. Scroll to the bottom of my website at techblogwriter.co.uk and you'll find all of the podcast episodes and links to all my social channels if you want to follow me on there. And as I always say, if you do follow me on any social channel, make sure you say hello so I know that you listen to this podcast. So if you want to browse other guests, we're now on all major platforms, including Pandora. If there's a podcasting platform that you prefer and I'm not on there, again, let me know and we'll sort that out. So I hope you're having a fantastic weekend. I'll return on Monday to ease you back into the week. But until next time, don't be a stranger. Thanks for listening to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. Until next time, remember, technology is best when it brings people together.